Welcome back to our second topic for today. Yes, I said that we are going to talk somewhere about in Europe. Now, Adi, what do we have in Europe? Right. So, before the end of last year, sometime last year, me and Hafiz did try to cover as much as we can on the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Usually that focuses on what is it that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin leader of Russia is actually trying to achieve here. Uh, then we moved on to the the move, like how when he was trying to take over the country, we had his old private military companies going up against him. And then suddenly being taken down one by one, political opponents being taken down one by one. Now in the recent news, we have seen a uh, very strong opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, who was sentenced to a 19-year prison sentence in an Arctic prison in Russia, suddenly turning up dead. Uh, his body was found, and then a week later, it was transported over to be given to his mother for the proper burial. And this has sparked a lot of outcry from a lot of Western media sources, considering how this individual, Alexei Navalny, was seen as sort of the a beacon or sort of a hero that would stand up against the tyranny of Vladimir Putin. Now, this came very charged because he painting this individual as some heroic uh, character fighting against autocracy and uh, essentially what can be called a dictatorship in Russia is mostly picked up by Western media sources and being propagated by the Western media sources. Of course, a lot of the media outlets in Russia are very much uh, controlled and censored. But we're now getting this whole image that this individual here, this opposition leader, was some, was someone that was fighting for every uh, Russian to uh, express their democratic rights, to fight against a tyrannical uh, overlord that has started an uh, unlawful war on a foreign country. So why I think this is very important is because uh, for someone like that to be sentenced to prison uh, and to be, to, be, to be found dead, it's really out of a KGB playbook here where a lot of political opponents back then of the Soviet Union were sent to the gulags and uh, they would be worked to death or they would be exiled. So Vladimir Putin being a former KGB operative, this is something that is not too, uh, how do you say, uh, different. This seems like uh, just standard fare. And knowing his uh, the past few years, he has never shied away from disposing of his political opponents in a way that is very barbaric or even uh un how do you say inhumane so a very particular character and i think if anyone here has watched that interview with Tucker Carlson uh where he just was asked about ukraine and then he went off on a whole rant about uh, russia's history the history. proud history from 1200 years ago this person not only dodges knows how to dodge particular questions this person is very well versed in statesmanship statescraft and all manner of intrigue uh, so you know telling his own version of history to suit uh image that uh, shows that he he is really russia's pinnacle quintessential leader so very uh, interesting situation um what do you think of this i mean um the murder, if you want to call it the murder, murder of uh, Alexei Navalny is a shock and surprising. I think it's neither. Uh, he's, even he was uh, in 2020, he was, he was poisoned and then, but relentlessly, he came back to Russia again to, and then just only to be, to be uh, thrown to jail. So I think, yeah, I mean, this guy is asking for something and he, the bravery that he has is something else, but uh, but Navalny is not the first one. So I think uh, there's a few instances in the past as well. Oppositions, uh, leader of oppositions, uh, been thrown in the jail, have been exiled, have, or have been murdered. So I think this is not just um, you know uh, exclusively to Navalny, but also. I think this is more of how Putin works. And uh, yeah, like you said, he is a former um, KGB operative. And then, uh, yeah, pulling one of the oldest tricks in the book, it's not going to be uh, uh, something very hard for him. But uh, what I'm interested in is how this is going to impact um, 
uh, Russian presidential election in less than a month now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, if you're surprised uh, hearing that Russia is gonna have election, yes, they do. So they gonna have elections, but of course we're gonna know who's gonna win it now that the the leader of Egypt is gone. Uh, Yulia Navalny now wants to be uh, in his, her husband's uh, shoes, but um, whether she be successfully uh, woo all the parties uh, to to make her the uh, presidential uh, candidates that's going to be uh, that's going to be uh, remain to be seen uh, another another thing that i'm interested in is that how uh, ukraine and russia conflict i mean this is another episode i mean we had another also uh, i think last year where the uh, pipeline was um, so called sabotage so could this be another sabotage in how the us wants to find another reason to blame putin on this because the timing seems to be a bit um a bit fishy because okay knowing that you're going to win the election no one's going to doubt like no one going to doubt that putin going to win the election but why now why less than few, uh, a, a month before election someone that already that weak to then you want to kill him you might as well kill him when you know he came back right away from uh, uh to, in 2021 but why now so it could be another um a, a old trick from a us uh playbook that they want to make this sort of uh Uh, become a justification to give more aid to Ukraine because they see that Ukraine is the only thing can stand up against uh, Putin now. Uh, internally, it's there's nothing. Nothing can penetrate Russia if you want to stop Putin. But Ukraine, there might be a hope. So that's why they uh, they're just going to say that, hey, Ukraine this is the this is opportunity for us western democracy to help Ukraine to topple Putin so i think that's where it could be but i'm i might be wrong reading it into this and hopefully i'm wrong it's just uh maybe maybe or maybe he's just really die from the uh, blood clot that was reported that you know that nobody nobody going to believe so yeah that's how i look at this I think you're maybe on to something here. I mean, there is no shadow of a doubt that who's going to win Russia's presidential elections. <laughs> um, and going back to what we talked about last year when Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner mm-hmm. Group, yes. uh, was mysteriously, his airplane crashed in, under mysterious circumstances. Of course, the immediate uh, culprit that a lot of the Western media turned to was Vladimir Putin himself. Putin. The same with Alexei Navalny. Um, whatever it is, if he was murdered or not, or whether or not he died of some unforeseen circumstances that are beyond uh, some you know, Russian state's control, I noticed that the Russian, uh, sorry, the Western media has been lionizing this character, trying to paint him as you know, like a hero. Like I said, going back to, as this beacon of opposition that's going to fight against Putin. Uh, I find that very odd, and I think. You know, going back to how you say that this may be some there's some U.S. interest involved here. I think as it's timely because the United States is also entering its uh, its own elections this year, and we just had a uh, recent news that the uh, Donald Trump was very popular. I think it was in Florida. I think something. You know. Yeah. Uh, so definitely a huge cause of concern for the Democrats who have always. Played on this whole well, Russian bots are making the Republicans win or something like that. So mm-hmm. they can always play into that narrative by using Russia as a scapegoat once again by putting like say, okay, well, um, Donald Trump, let's say, is a dictator. He's a horrible person, and now you see that oh, it's happening in Russia as well. Somebody that is fighting against a dictatorship, fighting against tyranny, has been killed. Uh, maybe they're playing into that kind of sentiment to ensure that uh, you know. By proxy, this would be uh, a tactic to, uh, how do you say, mitigate uh, Donald Trump's uh, momentum to become president once again. But it's funny 
I'm, this is where I find it really funny. Is because when they put Alexei Navalny as a freedom fighter kind of figure, they fail to consider or fail to remind us that this character is a racist, he is anti-immigration, he is very Islamophobic, and he is a staunch Russian ultra-nationalist. He himself has, you can liken himself to some of the individuals in the Azov group in Ukraine, very similar kind of tendencies right there, very nationalist individual. And it's funny how the Western media has forgotten to mention that part of his uh, character or who that's just who he is. Um, because, of course, it's not politically correct to point out that you're, you're one of the people we should be supporting is, in fact, a very con- ultra-conservative individual. So this is why I feel that this is used as a way to curb um, you know, the rise of the whole right, the right wing uh, rise in Europe and in America. Uh, this could just be one of those, how do you say, uh, psyops, basically, uh, just using this as an excuse to find a reason to target. At the same time, it also covers a lot of basis, a political basis on the home front. Uh, I've only ever seen nice things about this person given by Western media groups, really. I've never, like, just, when, but when you look at it just a bit more, you realize this person is an ultra-nationalist. He's Islamophobic. He's racist, anti-immigration, all, you know, all the things that a lot of people that are on the left uh, despise completely. Um, with even qualities that uh, Putin himself hasn't even stooped lo- that low to. So <laughs> I, I, this is, it's very ironic, really. I find it very, very mm-hmm. ironic. So um, that is, well, I can take from this kind of situation. It's, uh, of course, the media is playing or targeting a particular uh, story, running with it to fit some kind of uh, uh, media agenda as as per usual. Yeah, I mean, funny that you mentioned that because I I was also like I was just watching uh, public reaction, public reaction on the uh, on Navalny's death, and. Uh, I mean, younger people would say that yes, this is tragic death or whatever. But much older would would say to the uh, journalist that uh, this is something nothing. People not gonna remember him. This is the exact word of a uh, very old lady it says that no one gonna remember him. Not even you know uh, think about him uh, beyond his uh, 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 what happened last week. So I think this is uh, what you mentioned that. Uh, he is not popular even in his country, uh, Navalny. So I think that's why he doesn't get much traction in Russia to to let to, let alone to to topple uh, uh, Putin democratically. So um, I think he has to cover his own basis, and that he is not much better leader than uh, Putin. Putin is, if you want to compare uh, from that uh, side alone. But of course, uh, because of the Western, uh, the West. Um, the Western democracy feels that there's no one else that want to stood up uh, against Putin. So I guess the only one they have is Navalny. And now they're going to have to... Biden actually visited uh, Yulia and the daughter uh, of Navalny uh, uh, recently to se- to send his condolences. And um, I, I wonder what, what they were talking about because uh, after that talk... Uh, Yulia uh, also talking about very aggressively uh, putting out a video uh, to say to Putin that please return the body of my uh, that, that husband. Uh, we should bury him according to Christian Orthodox and whatnot. I mean, to send out a video like that, like, I mean, you better stay quiet. Or if you want to show s- certain character that you have with uh, your husband, you're going to end up with the same same fate as your husband, I think. So this is this is um again US at play, playing proxies in like you said, psyops that gonna um cover a lot of bases by just doing this. And of course, uh anyone wanna be uh are willing to be their donkeys and to, to so that they could have a slice of the pie here. So yeah, I think this is more than just a death in a in the Arctic penal prison, uh, just like how Epstein suddenly uh, died in prison as well. So this is no coincidence. There's a lot of at, at play here, but like 
most mysteries, no one can confirm anything. When what we been talking uh, or most media is talking is just a reading from what we have uh, snippets of uh, what we could uh, have. Um, Adi, uh, do you have uh, more to add to this? I think I just want to add to the broader conversation here because when we talk about Navalny, we talk about the death of an opposition leader and then that's going to reduce a lot of prospects for um, people who are willing to pick a choice other than Vladimir Putin in the next presidential elections. Um, but like you said, a very, very low chance to actually see leadership shift with those elections. And this just goes into what I've seen historically. Russia has always been very uh, authoritarian. It has always held a very strong um, autocratic state. It's always been that way for a very long time. Uh, we could see even like the time of the Tsars, where a lot of the central processes was made by uh, royal governments. And then later you had the Soviet uprising, which was meant to bring about more equality across uh, most of the people living in Russia, but that also sort of descended into a dictatorship in itself. Very, very hard to bring these kinds of democratic ideas that the West is so adamant in pushing on countries that has never really experimented much with the democratic idea. Now, I'm saying this also because when we look, when you ask, I've seen like uh, this one video of somebody asking like regular Russians on the ground uh, young and old, what do they think of uh, politics or who will they be voting for or stuff like that. And there's this huge sense of indifference. Like there is no, there's no feel like reason to really participate uh, unless it's um, issues like back in uh, about 10 years ago, we saw a lot of uh, uh, gay rights and a lot of feminist uh, protests coming up. And, but that never really got much anyway. Uh, any that much anywhere and much representation uh so it goes to show that for me that russia is still under that uh, feeling where i don't really want to vote change the status quo as long as the status quo status quo ensures some kind of stability uh, for me and my family and in a way vladimir putin has ensured that kind of stability uh, even though he did launch the war on ukraine Many Russians try to distance themselves from talking about it or to even comment about it. So I think at the end of the day, is for a lot of people there, stability is what really is of utmost concern for the regular person. So I think that allows Vladimir Putin to continue with the way he can, as long as he's able to manage uh, Russia's affairs in a way that does not uh, burden the people. Like even with the whole embargoes of all the the situations of like the West uh, imposing sanctions on Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin still found a way to pivot elsewhere, pivoting to China, uh, pivoting to bring up the idea of the BRICS, and then suddenly talking about how getting involved in the whole conversation of whether or not Elon Musk is a, is a genius or an idiot. So <laughs> they, they, it shows that how dynamic uh, Putin himself is willing to be. It's not just a stagnant a leader who's going to go with his own methods, he's very willing to be adaptive, to be at the same time uh, that, how do you say, uh, the quintessential Russian leader, but not somebody that is loud or abrasive or even obnoxious about it, like how most dictators are. Dictators usually try to show off their whole macho-ness, their whole uh, power, but Putin is quite smart because he, he's very ice-cold in that way. He knows how to wield his power. He knows how to exert his own will. And he knows how to keep himself in the limelight long enough to make an impact, but not long enough to actually be put under scrutiny or to be even, um, how you say, um, yeah, not to be... He knows how to move in and he knows how to pull back once he's made the perfect kind of impact. And he knows how to retreat back and get ready for his next move. That's how I would characterize him. And he's able to just continue on how he does because the stability that he brings it's how he why he tries to tie back a lot of modern russia to its very proud history trying to tie in the tucker carlson interview he tries to merge the two together as if there's an unbroken continuity and that he represents that continuity from the, their, their very long past so it's 
how I would characterize the situation and why I think maybe yeah he won't lose because most people have become used to the status quo that they have benefited from. Yeah, I mean, um, having that strong man character is really important to be a president of Russia. And uh, I don't think anyone is stronger than Putin in the upcoming election. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's still an election, hopefully for the best 450 million of Russians that will be voting or less, will be voting on um, mid-March um, uh, next month. So I think that's it for the Russian or the death of Navalny, the uh, opposition leader of Russia. So uh, we will come back with the next uh, topic.